Well, thank you, David, so much for joining me. Um, this has been a real spur of the moment thing on my part. It sort of gets to the end of the month for me. And I think, you know, what am I going to write about? And I have a few subscribers that follow your work and talk to me about your work, including one that I know you had a conversation with not so long ago called Richard Meredith. And I have um, another guy that I talked to that's always saying you need to check out David Murray. And um, this has really come on the back of an interview that I did the other week with a guy called Fred Harrison. I don't know whether you've heard of Fred, but he's a very successful economic forecaster. And um, he's forecast every sort of uh, major recession over the last few decades um, to the date. He's, he's, uh, and he's done it using the real estate cycle, using the 18 year real estate cycle, which of course is what I write about, as you know. Um, and he has been saying for a while, you know, we are heading for World War Three. He has it timed for the peak of this cycle. So 2026 or approaching the peak of this cycle, he has an utter Armageddon kind of scenario of destruction that's going to happen following the downturn. And that has led people writing to me saying, Catherine, we don't know where to put our money when all of this happens. And hence, I thought to myself, I don't know, or even like, how does it, how, what is war going to look like at that point? So this is where you, my friend, come in and my gratitude to you, because I have read some of your work. I've quoted you now again, when I've um, quoted on research from the Kondratiev wave, which I have written a, um, a little bit about myself. We know that the Kondratiev wave peak is um, around 2026. So the same as the real estate cycle. And we also know that wars are a feature when you reach the peak of the Kondratiev wave. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to you. And I'm wondering, David, if you can just give people that may never have come across you, they hear you're a global forecaster. They know that you probably haven't gone to university and done the course in how to be a global forecaster. So can you just give me a, it's a really interesting background. I'll stop talking in a minute and I'll let you get a word in. <laughs> and tell me, what is it that has led you to this point in your life? We might do the whole podcast. That might just be an hour itself, but let's see, see how you go. It's like someone once said to me, um, why did you come up with these ideas and not someone else? And that really got me thinking, actually. And it's to do with you know our, my life's experience. And it's like going along collecting points and suddenly points add up to something completely different. And I think the sort of key parts about those elements of those points were from the earliest age, much to my mother's chagrin, I was fascinated by warfare. And, you know, it, I would ask her to read me books on tanks or ships or and it was an innate fascination. And if I go back to why, I think it's two reasons. One is my family. You know, we're involved in the Indian Army and they were involved in the, in the RAF and the wars. So there was a martial, real connection. But it was way more than that. I think very early on, I sort of felt that wars were the clocks of humanity's story. I mean, I couldn't say that at a young age, but that was essentially what fascinated me. It wasn't about what we did in peace. It was what we did in war that defined who we were and how our civilizations operated. And funny enough, you know, as I come to my 60th birthday, that initial perception that started really a journey to this point, I think I've now proven that is the case. And we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the next bit, I was sort of born of, of a, a sort of empire, uh, the, the last remnants of empire in terms of the world was a small place and not a big place. And that cultures were different and they could live alongside each other with different values and constructs. So I, I sort of at a time when England had lost its empire, and we did become introspective. I was actually the, exposed to something completely different, which was a world that was fascinating out there through my parents' travels. Um, and the next bit was I chose physics at university. Yeah. And physics, I think, is a critical part of how you think, you know, how you reason, how you look at the evidence in front of you and come to conclusions that others might not because they're logical. And, you know, if there's one thing that my degree taught me, uh, which was also physics with geophysics, which we'll come on to, is basically how complex ideas can be described in simple, small equations. And that stuck with me. And that definitely led to the point of thinking about human interactions the same way as a physicist would, without the ability to describe them in maths, but conceptually the same way. And the other part was I studied geophysics because I was fascinated by the real life applications in our world. 
and it led me to be a seismologist and it led me to living in the Papua New Guinean jungle for three years mm -hmm. in the Sepik Basin, working um, for Shell uh, as a subcontracted company as a seismic operation with two and a half thousand Papua New Guineans and getting there right at the beginning when, you know, that Melanesian culture, which lives to the north of you, was really raw. You know, my first workforce were all cannibals. On the first day of work, when I asked them to work in the rain, they rioted on me. I was 100 miles from any help. And I thought my career my, my career had ended on its first day. And they were all armed with bows and arrows. And, and I saw this moment when essentially Augustus, the son of a chief, went apoplectic. And I remember thinking, I don't think I've ever seen anyone so angry. He's got an ax. He's got a bow and arrow. There were 60 other of them, 100 miles from any help. I wonder how this is going to go. And then to my a just shock that energy spread to the other 60 and they all represented the same hostile anger towards me and he could feel it was like a palpable wall and i do remember thinking i probably won't survive this i can't run i can't fight there's too many of them so i decided to follow my grandmother's you know memsab imagery of show no fear and i jumped into the middle of them and i walked through them almost by will forcing them not to attack me and walked to my tent about 100 yards away thinking I'm still alive. I can't <laughs> believe it. They were regrouping because in their culture, subsequently, I learned that people basically, if you run, you get hacked to bits. But I didn't run. I moved forwards. And that didn't fit into their culture. So then they surrounded my tent and started to individually come in and hit me. And I decided to ignore those problems because I figured they'd all pile in. And two hours later, I was still alive. And they were sitting around my tent in this vacant condition, like a child after the biggest temper tantrum exhausted. Mm. And now later they were working for me and they had no memory of what they had just felt or done or antagonism towards me. Now that was really like a lasting impression of all sorts of similar circumstances. So it wasn't one off, it became an, a norm. And I sort of, as a physicist developed this theory that they humans were collective. What I'd seen is the collective sharing of emotion a capacitor had been charged in effect with Augustus's anger and it discharged with time and there was no residue. And they had a low threshold of individuality because they were tribal. But of course, I figured we were looking, I was looking back into our past because we were modern human beings. And uh, the next step of the story takes place about three years later when I decided I wanted to come back into civilization and I changed jobs completely. And I found myself on the trading floor of JP Morgan uh, and as a good scientist, knowing nothing about economics or markets. And so I thought I'd observe like scientists should do and see what I could see or or derive myself. And uh, I noticed people from the East End on the trading floor were good at telling you what was going to happen tomorrow, the next day. And on the whole, the economists were absolutely useless. And that fascinated me. And then I took another look and thought, oh, my goodness, I've seen this collective behavioral pattern. It's exactly the same as in Papua New Guinea. It's happening to us and we're not so different. Maybe our threshold of individuality is higher, but we are subsumed by a collective dynamic that's mm -hmm. unconscious that we're not even aware of. And that was just like a light turning on and then mm -hmm. became one of the first prop traders. And I did, you know, started using wave counting to go. Ultimately, uh, I found wave counting, which I think is the most fractal understanding of how markets and collectives work. Elliot's work is truly amazing. Yeah. It is, and it fits into the ballpark of, as a physicist, it was fractal. And so, you know, because it's a very visual process, most of the people that can wave count are quite art artistic, therefore they get discounted. Mm -hmm. But having to be, to, to be able to do both, I think it's a very scientific language of the description of probabilities for a market series of outcomes. And if you interlay a lot of them, as I do for global forecaster, like 80 global markets, it's like a probability field that entwines into this holographic construct. And it is incredibly informative and predictive. But mm -hmm. that's 35 years of work and evolution to create something as effective as that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I decided on that helipad just before the riot on the first day in Papua New Guinea that I would work for myself. So during my seven years as I became a vice president, Essentially, I wanted to accumulate the skills to set up the first hedge fund, one of the first in Europe, which is what I did. And then a little later, we followed it with an emerging markets hedge fund with emerging asset management, which I still have. And I managed money all the way through the next 20 years until about 2012. We captured the top of the Asian crisis, bought the bottom. Uh, we got the whole sort of 01, 03 decline. Uh, we got the Argentine crisis, got slightly caught in the Russian crisis, but came out smelling of roses, made about... 85% in the 07, 08 decline, even more in the flash crash. 
So dislocations were something that I had a natural penchant for finding as a contrarian thinker with systems that threw up reversal points and actually had to learn how to live in the trends where nothing much was happening. And that's much more a linear thinking process. And I stopped managing money in 2012 because after 9-11, I had had this seminal moment. And it was, what if the West isn't going to be in dominance for 100 years? What if 9-11 was an immune system failure between two intelligence services that were competing, which would be a sign of decline because they weren't suborned to a greater purpose for national protection, but more interested in their own you know, one-up, one-upmanship? And what if that moment was a seminal moment? And how could I see it? And that was when things got a little bit difficult because price data in markets where you might expect to see the story unfolding doesn't really go back more than 100, 120 years. That's really any use. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, well, how could you see a system that's 500 years old in the Western Christian world's empires without price data? And of course, it occurred to me, build a model based on how you see the rise and fall of a fractal of a, a stock market or a company um, and then understand the underlying psychology of that process, translate it up through the fractal spectrum into an empire and mm. use wars as the clocks of empire. Mm. And hence was born very quickly the five stages of empire model. Now, mm. having come up with this process, there were five stages. Systems expand through demographics and they're forced to organize themselves into better, more effective systems. They self-organize and they are start off being linear. And the difference between linear is but here's an expert, but we'll come back to linear natural in a minute. They, they organize themselves. They go through the first stage of regionalization. There's a civil war where the lateral adaption wins over the linear people that normally rule at that stage. Warfare in through the civil process creates a weaponized society. It then expands, runs up its resource chains, algorithmically and exponentially builds an empire. And then it reaches a point of maturity. At maturity, you need less lateral adaptions because you dominate everything. And so now linear institutions start to rise up and you go through the top of the cycle where, in fact, all the lateral rulers are kicked aside and more linear processes replace it. Now you're into overextension where you look enormously powerful, but you've really stopped being competitive and productive. And you're in a sort of moribund state waiting for someone to come and take it from you. You just don't know it yet. You're hubristic, you're you're socially integrated, funnily enough, at that stage. And that's when the system of, on the way up, people serve the system. They believe in a bigger concept. They'll give their life for that bigger concept. They'll fight for that concept. The service, there's duty, the suborning of the individual to the collective. As you start to go down the other side, it's the other way around. Now the individual starts saying, well, I'm more important than the system. Mm -hmm. And gradually, as you move into overextension, narcissism creeps into your leadership constructs it's everywhere and the result of that narcissism is the system now starts to eat itself it no longer has self-belief it's no longer productive because it's got rid of its mavericks and and creativity starts to stop and hubris means it doesn't see the rising system that's about to come along and challenge it and and having defined that cycle in essence i went through every system i could find and i was shocked at how battles happened which i used as the clocks of war types of battles and outcomes and decisions taken by leaders were remarkably similar for thousands of years. And I did actually sit back on my haunches and think, Christ, that, I call it breaking the code of history because it was like the code of our human existence just dropped out in front of us. Or, and, 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 and so the next step was to create a model for the current world. Um, and the problem I first faced was Western Christian empires, Portugal, Spain, Holland, um, France, Britain, Germany, America, they all had much shorter durations than 350 to 450 years, which was the average cycle of organization before. And I thought, well, maybe that's technology. And then it dawned on me. In fact, the national systems of the Western world are bonded to a religious Christian meme. So Mm. regionalization was Catholic, very linear, you know, controlling. Mm. And that civil war was broken by the Protestant powers, which were far more lateral. They were unconstrained by, you know, by by Rome's construct. You must think the way we think. And sea power was their product and expressions to Holland and Britain with Mm. far greater coastlines to internal volume, far more lateral populations became globally dominant. Mm. And that was the case where small lateral systems using sea power started to dominate the world. Um, And then along came obviously Germany twice, which tried to overturn Britain. And America is the last of the Western Christian empires. 
Mm. So that was a big wake up call. Like, whoa, hang on a second. And then I realized using that system, America entered decline after 9 11. Yes. And the first signs of that decline, which we now accept, was the loss of moral imperative through torture and rendition. Something that seems so small, but moral imperative is how a system not only believes it should govern, but actually other systems allow it to govern because it has a moral superiority it believes in, it's self-belief. And torture and rendition, thanks to Rumsfeld and Cheney, came about. And that was the beginning of the erosion. Mm -hmm. And the next step was along came Obama, who was highly narcissistic. It was all about Obama, but it was also about something else. It was when, and this is, I'm really far from racist or classist, so I need to disqualify this as an observation of a social process rather than a commentary. But mm -hmm. when what happens in a the, the declining system is the overclass stop breeding and the underclass continue to breed at higher rates. So the demographic shifts. And the moment when the demographic is big enough from the old underclass, which is more socially integrated by that time, starts to go and elect leaders, the leaders have different agendas. And Obama was just such a leader. He was a leader that looked for social integration, but didn't really think the power of the empire was valuable. And he allowed the porousness of the American system to be to be facilitated. He you know, did everything he could wrong in Syria, essentially, with what took place with um, um, Putin. He was humiliated in the New York Times with Putin's letter. And, you know, he accelerated, catalyzed the third um, democratic revolution in Ukraine, but thinking there wouldn't be any consequences. And of course, there were and didn't respond to them. And at the same time, he let the island chain structures be built, which were the beginning of Chinese expansion. So Obama has an awful lot to answer for. In eight years, it was the biggest power giveaway America's ever seen since its peak. Mm -hmm. And of course, that swings back then to make me great. And along comes Trump, another narcissist. But this time, he's overtly narcissistic. <laughs> yeah. The great narcissist along with Boris. <laughs> and, you know, he made America weaker because one of the things I will say from personal observation that the narcissists would destroy whatever systems they work in. They always only further themselves and ever the people around them. And it's something that often there are bargains that we make and think, well, Trump, you know, at least sort of unveiled China. But at the price of unveiling China, he weakened the system irrevocably. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the involvement of narcissists is really bad news in systems, in my opinion, because leadership should serve the people they lead, which is another part of the rise and fall structure. Anyway, so that was the five stages of empire. And part of that empire cycle is then how wars are fought, fought mm -hmm. and why we fight wars. And mm -hmm. that's to do with polarization, the commodity cycle. And more recently, um, a, a theory which I've created called the anti-entropy of humanity. And it explains humans' survival strategy. And it's probably worth talking about it because it's the thing that then everything else that follows it makes sense. And then it becomes logical. So my theory is based on being a physicist and the observation that the world is entropic. It goes from, you know, a condition of energetic to not energetic, from disorder, from order to disorder. That's the world we live in. Yeah. So when you actually think about that philosophically, life is a miracle because life has to fight against an entropic universe. It's constantly been acted against as the universe goes from something to nothing, from mm. from order to disorder. So, so whatever lives, whatever DNA there is, it has to work hard to continue to be. Mm. And each DNA strand, each life form has a different strategy. Human life form is based on our intelligence and our social constructs, because as one person, we can sweep the doormat and we can keep our house clean. As a tribe, we can look after a village. And, you know, as an empire, we can start to impact the whole world around us. And so we created social structures to maximize what I call anti-entropy, which is the pushback of this entropic effect in the world around us. And a good example was if you were a small tribe and the weather was really bad and you had become agrarian over 10,000 years ago and the rain didn't come, you all starved. But by the time you're an empire in Rome and you had a local problem with grain in Egypt, you could get it from Spain. And so no longer did you care about rain stopping. You did care but you would survive it. So it's an example how scale of social organizations push back entropic effects that were part of our universe. Mm. Now, the next thing that's interesting is to be sharp, we had to create systems that were constantly expanding because the moment you stop expanding, you are actually subject to entropy because you're not pushing back against it. So we use wars 
to basically decide who is the strongest. As, so as an empire reaches its peak and it goes into sequestered decline, essentially as a new system rises, a war takes place to see whether or not the hegemon remains strong or the challenging system can displace it. And if it displaces it, it will make a new peak in collective anti-entropy. And there is the story of human evolution. Mm. Social systems that rise to create coherence and order and anti-entropy, that when they atrophy or you know, they are then challenged by a new system, that new system makes a new peak because obviously the innovation of war begats new technology, which feeds through the system, new styles of leadership, which are more effective. The migration, for example, of you know hierarchy to to meritocracy and democracy came through the navies that were more effective and individuals that wanted says and took responsibility. And that whole evolution is one that that's our story. So when we sit back and say we all abhor war, why does it keep happening? It keeps happening because it's intrinsic to our evolution. Mm. And we do not recognize that. And until we do, we're not going to stop doing it until we find a substitute. And, and we're going to have to pretty soon, as in this decade, because the war that we're about to embark on will be so destructive if we do, there won't be anything left. And it's actually contra survivable. If you go back to the First World War, horrendous as the Western Front was, mm. it was 1% of the world's population that died. Mm. You go back to the Second World War, which is even more horrendous, it was 3%. So mm. wars are absolutely hell if you're in them, but as a percentage of the total population, they're remarkably small. And then you get to some sort of idea of why they benefit and where these changes come from. So we need to be much more cognizant of that and cognizant that we are going into a danger period or we're in a danger period, which brings me to the next point, uh, which is why we fight. We mm. fight over resources. We fight because those resources fuel those social systems and when those resources you know, become contested, war breaks out. Yeah. And before they become contested, we start dehumanizing the other system through a process of polarization, which is the accentuation of our social differences. And it's the thing that's most obvious. It can be color, it can be views, it can be the thing that literally makes the quickest, easiest definition to put them outside our circle of influence. That's what polarization is. And, you know, right now, for example, if you think about this whole issue over tanks going to Ukraine, finally, a truly sleepy West who mm. has, you know, allowed Putin to get away with his invasion didn't deter him, our failure, when we should have been, we had an obligation to protect Ukraine with previous accords. Essentially, we have now worked out that we actually can go on the offensive and we don't just have to passively accept aggression. So we are slight, we're moving in a secondary polarization into a defensive mechanism. It's taken ages to get there, but it's a milestone because it means that we go to the next stage, spend more money on defense, and we'll see China in the true light, which is an expansive, aggressive system that has to move soon or not move at all, which we'll talk about. Mm. Your knowledge is, and, and the way that you've analyzed this is really interesting because um, you know, you're, you're recognizing that it is human emotion and human behavior and that inform these patterns and these models that you've created. And obviously you're using these models to inform yourself as to where the markets are gonna go and the timing and everything. But um, the, the interesting thing about your analysis of the Kondratiev wave, I think also is that um, when I first started to look into it, there are so many people out there that have got the timing inaccurate with the Kondratiev wave. There's many people that they, they don't see that the peak is going to come around 2026. So there's a timing element there, which is really curious as to why they've got that um, inaccurate. And then obviously um, looking at that would, I, I, I assume that when you came across that analysis, was that kind of like your switch into thinking that, uh, into viewing the world through a kind of resource lens? Because it Absolutely. was- Absolutely. Um, yeah, because it, I mean, I think the the, the quote in, in, in the, um, in his paper, in um, Nikolai's paper was basically where he said about war, he said, it is during the period of the rise of the long waves, i.e. during the period of high tension in the expansion of economic forces, that as a rule, the most disastrous and extensive wars and revol revolutions occur. And of course, if you've got that timing and that knowledge, and you've looked at that um, paper, and you've, you know, you've, you've done the timing, then you would be aware of what you're talking about now, which is, hang on a second, we're at this pivotal time. And I think, let's go, I mean, again, he, I came across his work about the same time as Eliot's work in about 80, 88, 87, somewhere around there. And of course, being fascinated by war, 
suddenly my fascination with war and my chosen career linked. And that fascinated me. At the time, I didn't think the ever, you know, I didn't really look at it enough to go bingo. The real bingo moment came when I drew it back in after 9-11. And then, and I think an interesting way to look at it is we tend to think about, and Kudratia's observation is via inflation and CPI, that you see the, the, the this pattern. And, and this pattern, let's, let's just look at it in detail. It's basically three waves up and three waves down, which once you start to apply Elliott waves, makes a lot of sense and is really clear, for example, in oil. Oil right now started in 2000, and I identified that there was a contracted wave, and we made an enormous amount of money by investing into Russia, buying Luke oil at 64 cents, selling it at $64, everything commodity-based, including building, building the biggest agricultural agglomerate in South Africa with Harvard, was inspired by my knowledge of the contractive cycle. Mm. Now, my knowledge also knew that I could get out in 2010 and 11, and there would be a decade of contra-trend action that wasn't what I wanted to be a part of. But I knew I did want to be part of what came at the end, which was the C wave. Yeah. So if you look at what we've seen already, we've seen a, an A wave, which yeah. surges into 2010, 11. Some of them, some commodities, it's nine, it's split across the commodity groups. So you need to be, if you're looking at, you know, precise signals, understand not every commodity system is exactly in line, some are slightly out of phase, some in, but there's an average. And then you look at the B wave, which has gone on since then, all the way through to the low of 2020. Now that B wave was pretty long and pretty weak, if I'm honest. And one of the reasons I think it's weak is because Western demand as part of that cycle came at the end of the empire dynamic. It was a low dynamic, despite being replaced by China. And, and, and this whole financial printing process created leverage, which made systems look like they're healthy, but their true demand was actually lower in because of the financialization element. That's relevant because that's why we got negative oil. It was so low at the bottom of that cycle. But the moment we got minus 17 bucks or whatever it was on oil that day, that was the end of the B wave and the beginning of the C wave. And at that moment, the Chinese shifted, interestingly enough, um, to the same strategy that the Nazis followed. Mm -hmm. And the Nazis in 1936 marched into the Ruhr, as we know, in the Rhinelands with 12,000, 10,000 men. France was busy having a gold crisis, so it didn't intervene. And they took this whole piece of territory. And the net effect of taking it essentially was that um, the alliance between uh, France and Italy and Poland um, completely collapsed because they couldn't link through the Rhinelands. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of this whole offensive expansion of Nazism. And the four-year plan was essentially militarization of our economy and we'll go bust by 1940, so we better go to war by 1939. And I think she took the same decision. At the bottom of that cycle, he started accumulating resources like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. And essentially, they stopped a, a, a manufacturing export-driven economy cycle, which had been funded by duping the West into investing in their industrialization. And they've replaced it with a much more internally fueled system, which is why we see things not coming out in the same way. And they are definitely in the last phases of this military challenge with a window coming up. Mm -hmm. So we are in the sea wave. And then along came Ukraine. And Russia's behavior is also very contractive orientated in that Russia is not a demographically expansive system. It is literally stuck in legacy, having lost you know, the Cold War. And demographics in Russia are the worst in the Western world. There is no national energy, as I call it. What there is is an, an expansive Putin who then took on a commodity producing society and the revenues linked to energy, especially oil, to some degree gas later on, but oil are correlated to the Kondratiev cycle. So what you see in, is, in Russia is a, is a demographically inert country in legacy animated by the wealth that comes from the commodity cycle. And of course, as things started to go up, you can imagine at minus 17, he was probably a little nervous about going to war. But as the price started to move up, you know, and he'd built up large war chests over some of the periods when oil was over 113 and 120 for years. And that's what inspired his new weapon systems that he thought strategically would keep him safe. What he thought was a rejuvenation of the Russian army, which happens to not be for a reason we'll talk about. And essentially all of those things coming together essentially gave him the current that it made it obvious and I was able to predict his invasion six months beforehand by where he was the noises he was making the fact that the West had withdrawn from Afghanistan precipitously thanks to Biden which was a red flag to any aggressive bull like Xi or Putin all of those things came together to enact really what is a war of expansion 
without the energy of expansion. And it was all predicated on a quick victory. And we know that victory has failed. And right now, there is no substitute for raising conscripts when his post-Cold War weapons are predominantly being destroyed and the West are providing weapon systems that are substantially more capable. And we are going to see a spring offensive where I think the Russian forces get rolled back at a shocking speed because they have nothing to counter this. They'll probably take Crimea again and then there'll be some sort of drive for peace. But then the next escalation is China's involvement. So mm. although it looks like we're moving to a more offensive, correct policy with throwing Russia out of Ukraine, once these dominoes start to fold, they keep falling. And the problem is, as you've pointed out, the Kondratia peak is 25, 26. Mm -hmm. So we are, you know, we the, our commodity price levels have just finished surge one. We've gone sideways for nine months. Mm. And I think we're about to have a, the biggest surge in commodities we've ever seen which are about resource constriction and it's about conflict and bifurcation of the world into autocracies and democracies. Just as Russia was cut out of the West, China will be cut out by its actions too. And, and of course, this is part of them sensing weakness in the West as well, isn't it? I mean, that, that there's a big timing element to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So not just uh, in it becoming wealthy through the commodity cycle, but also the sensing of you can see. I mean, anybody can see it when they're looking at the West. They can see what you're talking about, that fifth stage of your empire model. You can see that they're in decline, including the money printing that's that's been happening on such a huge scale. I mean, we're getting to the point, and I think this is a point where, that Fred Harrison made in the interview that I had with him, where you know we get to the end of this cycle. You can't print your way out of this cycle anymore. You can't print your way out of it downtown anymore. And people have essentially lost trust in those institutions. Um, so that so that's thing I want you to comment on but the other thing when before you go off and comment on that one is is your you also in I think it was in breaking the code of history where you um forecast that what would happen when the next pandemic hit and I'm interested in your theory around that because you see um China that coming from a lab in China and that um that being a part of their plan to destabilize the global economy so those are the two points that I okay. wanted to. So let, let's do let's do let's deal with um, the predictions I made back in because breaking the code of history was published in 09, but actually it was written as a thesis in 03. Mm. Amazing. And, um, and that was where I entwined all of the constructs that then predicted successfully the past 20 years. What I highlighted was that China was in a hegemonic struggle, an arms race against America. And therefore, it, it, like all hegemonic challenges, you've got a hegemon that's invested decades in weapon systems. Britain, you know, into 1914, or prior to the dreadnought challenge of 1906, had a big enough navy to deal with any two countries in the world and flatten them. That was because over decades, it added similar systems and just got iteratively better, but immense number of ships through huge investment. Long came the dreadnought revolution and the game started all over again. And Britain and Germany had to match, build, you know, dreadnoughts and super dreadnoughts at the same pace, which nearly killed Britain, by the way, to stay ahead of that was a huge struggle. And it meant that we didn't have a big army and Germany simultaneously built the biggest army in Europe. Now, the reason why I kind of mentioned that hegemonic dynamic is that the Germans also, when they failed to directly build enough dreadnoughts, started building submarines because submarines were asymmetric, they would basically provide a means to, and although the Royal Navy had submarines, they were much more, I want them because of you. For the Germans, it was, we can interdict the sea lanes of supply that come from America to Europe, and we can strangle our enemies. So it was an asymmetric, challenging weapon. Mm -hmm. And I predicted the Chinese would be seeking weapons of asymmetry. And one of those weapons would be biological warfare, which in the interim, the problem for biological warfare was it was indiscriminate. But biogenetic work was moving towards, you know, you could pick up a, a gene with a race so you could target it to a race or, you know, make your own race immune from an, from an infection, which gave it, you know, biological research, a massive plus for that asymmetric advantage. And it suddenly came to life again. And so I was acutely aware of it. I raised the topic and I said that the Chinese would literally spend enormous amounts of time and research finding a biological advantage in some form of asymmetry and that that. that weapons lab development of these things would mean that either accidentally or intentionally it would come from a Chinese weapons lab. So that's logical to me. It's a product of hegemonic challenge that they would be seeking that research. And the evidence is overwhelming. 
they have been. Mm -hmm. And so when it turned up at the end of you know 2019, and uh, it was 19, wasn't it? It was 19. Um, and I saw it appearing. I thought that thing spreads disproportionately, as in normally systems that uh, diseases that are new take time to adapt to mm -hmm. spread. But this thing was spreading like wildfire, mm -hmm. which suggested it, it had been adapted somewhere in a laboratory to spread. Mm -hmm. And if you look at MERS, for example, which is a naturally occurring um, similar process that comes out of camels, essentially it spreads intermittently, never really got going, couldn't jump from human to human, couldn't adapt. This thing was adapted for human transmission. That was the warning cell that whatever it was came out of a laboratory. And I think the thesis is interesting in that definitely came out of the laboratory. You know, you'll hear about furin cleavages, ding, ding, alarm, man-made incisions in the virus to replicate, help it replicate faster. Um, and the reason why it was all dampened down, in my opinion, was a, the Chinese did a bloody great job of sort of getting into the Lancet and who they paid in various yeah. forms to get a natural origins piece in. And B, you had this huge side in the Western world that invested in Chinese industrial base that was going to keep you know, manufacturing and inflation low. And they didn't want to go and basically you know, upset the apple cart. So from and I think also U.S. agencies were involved in the penetration of those labs, which is natural. And somewhere they may have made a mistake by giving them transmugenic mice in return for an early DNA string of, of, the, of, of the spike, in which case, you know, it was completely covered up. And yet it is absolutely clear to me that let's just take two options. One, it was accidental, but what did they do from the point of accident? Well, they weaponized it. We know they did. The evidence is they maximized its spread into the outside world. Mm -hmm. And the other is, was it a random moment? No, it wasn't because they'd been exposed by Trump as the competitors to America. They had basically, their, their covert two decade long operation since the third Taiwan Straits crisis to entice us to build their manufacturing base so they could have an arms race and beat us was just well and truly in progress. Mm -hmm. And Trump unveiled that clumsily. And the result was the timing was get me back to where I should have been. And what basically the pandemic did that no one talks about, it basically sent our debt ceilings through the roof. And they were our debt ceilings that we would use to arm ourselves as we went into conflict with China and challenge. So it disabled a whole element of how we could respond through you know, more weapons, great arms race, through this peak to bring about peace through deterrence. So strategically, it was incredibly successful. Forget the fact that they're going through hiccups in China right now for whatever reasons which we could talk about somewhere else. They have literally hamstrung the West through the debt ceiling. I mean, 400 million pounds, billion pounds in the UK is 10 times our annual defense budget. If we're to spend that on a lump sum right now, that would be a single act of deterrence in intention that makes everyone think, should we be doing it? And everyone else did the same and the Chinese wouldn't have had a chance. They at least know that they were facing an implacable enemy determined to defend their challenge. But the pandemic decided to remove that. And it also showed complete elements of weakness in our governments you know, and responses that I think, you know, dog, dogmatic responses that were disproportionate showed a, a sense of, I, I, I hate to be, um, how can I say it? Um, and I'm not, but every decision the government takes is a matter of you know, the balance of statistics of how many people die, how many people survive, whether the state survives and we shifted towards protecting the older segments of our society that really had short durations of life and sacrificed essentially the future longevity and survivable of everyone else in the process. And we didn't do it without any rational process. And I think an awful lot of the linear leadership that, that did it was for their own reasons of power and control. In the UK, we had a lockdown brigade who were all about control and they left a swathe of damage. So it was very successful in short. Yeah, when you talk about the lockdown brigade, you would have heard what happened in Australia, particularly in Melbourne. I think it was, uh, we were known for having the longest lockdown globally here. And it it's, was. It's a really good example of linear dogma. Mm. It was um, it was an interesting period of time because I think it was a period of time where people started to really investigate. Um, you know, people were at home and they were looking on the internet and they were being prodded from the outside by people by authorities saying that you can't move you can't go to work you know you you you've got to go into economic you've got to be dependent on the government if you like and um there were huge protests in australia over that time i mean the, the biggest in our recorded history protests that happened through that period of time to say that you know people had had enough they weren't happy with the mandates and the author authoritarianism and um it was all ignored 
It was that nothing, nothing happened, nothing changed. And I think that the concept in people's minds is that it not, we don't have any power anymore over steering things how it's not a democracy anymore because the say that we're having and the 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 well, outcry that we're having is not even being addressed other than to call that look, community extreme look at the barrington declaration four thousand qualified people saying that this lockdowns are not the right route mm -hmm. and basically it was quashed and so you're right the whole process what was interesting was it sort of migrated the Western world into an imposed construct, which if the level of threat had been commensurate with the response would have been appropriate, but it wasn't. And then what happened with that is this dogmatic form of linear leadership. And, and we're riven with linear leadership in the West because money printing created artificial stability. And now we've got these entropic waves of change, war, inflation, and these and their leaders just don't even know what they are, what to cope with and how to cope with them. And one of the reasons why war is so stimulating to the growth of the human system is because war is a domain of lateral thinkers. It requires constant adaptation against the other side. And that's where our greatest advances happen. They don't happen when we're dominated with linear thinking. They happen when we have a challenge and lateralism is required to survive. And mm. so it brings me back to the Kondratiev cycle, which, you know, in terms of Nikolai's observations, were based on surges on inflation and, and commodity prices. But I've come to the conclusion it may be even more intrinsic than that. And that what really it represents is some heartbeat for the rate of change of human society. It's an unconscious kind of drive because originally, if you think about it, Kondratiev looked at the Western world, the old Western world, mm -hmm. and everyone else sort of followed. With the Chinese and other systems rising, I always wonder whether that cycle might be changed, evolved, shifted. But the drip, the beat, and you could argue because the world's a global economy, but nevertheless, it is like a, a, a life's heartbeat, which is across the whole of the human system. And what that heartbeat represents is the rise and fall of entropy and anti-entropy, and it spikes. So the big surge that we're going through is an, is, is an entropic spike. It's yeah. like a collective sort of lack of coherence and challenge, and, and, and it stimulates massive change through conflict. And then we go through, so, so somewhere in it, I think it's the drumbeat of human evolution. It's way more than an inflationary cycle. Mm. And it's much more intrinsic in our collective psychology as to how it operates, which, mm. which also is interesting when you look at central banks who you know, are very linear in the way that they've printed forever and think they've got control. And I always laugh that, you know, you look at the Bank of England, it creates a separate asset company. It puts all the guilt that it bought <laughs> from the government into this big pile and it funded it with short-term interest rates, which at the beginning looked quite smart. And now it's got itself a bunch of gilts which have gone down since they bought yeah. them, so they've lost capital. And yeah. they're funded not so short-term, the price is going up. Those MMT programs are bombs sitting under our central banks. Mm -hmm. And they also explain the conflict of interest that the interest rate managers have, which is every time they put up interest rates, their little MMT program sitting on to, that's underneath them is about to go up and blow a, a bit closer. And they haven't seen it, don't understand what it is. And I think the next surge this year, and it's a big call because everyone thinks there is the inflation's under control, but we called the first surge. So I have confidence that the system will work in the second surge is going to be a shocking experience. Now, mm. you mentioned house prices and you know, you're into real estate. And normally inflation is an enormously beneficial thing if you can fix your mortgage and the price of your house goes up and your mortgage goes away. That's what we're all sort of brought up with. But I think this impact is about all those people that were always over levered in the first place and their cost of living eats them alive because their real wealth collapses and they can't support those mortgages. So I think we're in for a real real estate hit as we are for every other asset class in the Western world simultaneously. Private equity, real estate, equities, bonds, just about everything but the commodity sector will will be, I think, wealth destructive. Mm. And I, I guess I would agree with you on that. The, the only disagreement that we might have is in terms of timing, because I would say that that period of time would happen at the peak of the cycle. So going from 2026 into 2028, because that is the... Um, that's the timing for this 80, this current 18 year cycle. And it has a lot of history behind it. So we're looking at, you know, hundreds of years of history where you can trace the cycle back through real estate prices, um, where you've got these long term housing indexes in Europe. 
Um, and then I think what Fred Harrison did when he traced it back to the um, sort of 1600s in um, the UK was that he was also looking at history and he was looking at the downturns in history and what might have led up to that. So a similar thing as to what you're doing, you know, where you say if you don't have the price in front of you or an index in front of you in order to analyse the price, then you've got to look at historically of what was going on um, at the time as well. But um, so, I mean, the, the I, I agree with that and the, the subscribers, obviously, that, that follow... Um, the work that I do, which is based on that cycle, would be making preparations as to what to do when we get to the peak of that cycle. So they wouldn't be necessarily worrying about their real estate at this point, even though we've had a bit of a downturn this year through the shock of interest rate rises, things look like they're improving now. I think even in London, prices of the house prices, of, the median price in London has, has increased over the last 12 months. It hasn't well, if you look at the average home price in the UK, it peaked in August, and I think I called the high in August, mm. and it's been going down ever since. London's slightly an anomaly as an international city, but in terms of prices in the UK, they've peaked on the nationwide index, in my opinion. And I'll present a slightly different view about, I don't think things just happen on the day of the peak, and especially when the peak is truly like one of the, I mean, if you look at the peak of 75, you know, where CPI was 15, in the US. Um, that environment, and I could model you the whole Cold War on a Kondratiev cycle, which I'll do just briefly because it's quite instructive. <laughs> At the beginning of the 50s, the USSR, obviously, its economy grew and grew into 75 because it was producing commodities. It was inflation hedged. And, you know, at that stage, if you went to a capitalist and said, do you think we're going to win the Cold War? Most people would say, no, we're not. Look, they're winning. And as a result of more money, essentially, they essentially produce better weapon systems. Even their weapon systems look better than ours into 75. And conversely, in America, despite being at the peak of its empire cycle, it was choking on inflation, choking on it. And, you know, and social disharmony and all the dynamics and losing until the peak rolled over and the opposite happened. Huge fixed standing army for the Soviets. Armies are awful, by the way, because they just cost you money unless you use them. Navies are really great because they build sea power and trade routes. So mm. navies provide financial return and armies just cost you money, as the USSR found out. And then obviously they went more and more bankrupt as the commodity cycle went into reverse. Mm. So, so that's one Kondratiev cycle and one Cold War dynamic. And of course, that Cold War has started again, and that's why Putin's doing what he's doing. The difference is, is if you go back to the second, first world war, CPI was more like three times higher at the peak because of conflict. Yeah. And so if a conflict, so if you think of your peak being 15% CPI triggering housing price problem, now think of that peak being 45 mm -hmm. and well before the peak, you're going to be experiencing changes. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why these changes are going to be earlier is because the this is a, the terminal phase of the Western Christian system, which means that the wealth embedded in that system has been declining for 20 years. Real wealth, apart from a few uber wealthy inflated by money printing and asset price inflation, most other people have got poorer and poorer and poorer. And now inflation's come along post COVID, what little savings they have have been eroded at a staggering rate. So the combination of decline, like smaller pools of wealth before this event onset started, I think means that we're likely to see the whole thing start much earlier than mm. than just the peak. Mm. Um, so I agree with you, that's probably where a peak is. But I think that peak's going to be so high by the end of it. I mean, probably higher than any other peak in 200 years, is my guess. I think, but, yeah, I mean, you, you've got some really good points there. I think the only thing that I would say about the real estate market, particularly from an Australian perspective, is government tinkering. And, and we've seen that in the UK as well. So obviously the government, the, there's no government minister that wants to see a housing collapse on their watch. And so yeah, it's very yeah, tempting to, to tinker around in the housing. I mean, obviously there's a point of time where it comes where they can't do anything about it because it's got to that stage. And you, you know, um, I mean, we know historically that when you, in the second half of the real estate cycle, you see interest rates rising and, and for a period of time, property land prices, I should say, continue to rise with interest rates. But what we see in Australia is a lot of government meddling in the market. So changes in government policy, home buyer grants, so on and so forth, to keep the market going. And also we've had this um, remark, and I know you've had this in the UK as well, but this, this remarkable rise in rents, which is still occurring here because now the borders have opened and immigration is coming back in. We've got, um, you know, the China, 
know, Chinese borders have eased, so we've got student immigration coming back in. So there's those dynamics are still very much with us in Australia. So I would, I would, you know, even I'm not ruling out that there could be an early peak to the cycle. I think we always have to be prepared for what's going to happen. But I would say that I think that there's a there's a bit of fuel left yet before we see. I think Britain scale. and Australia are very different. Remember, we are a consumer taker. So we are subject to all of the vagaries of increased inflation. Australia is a commodity economy. Mm -hmm. So you have a different dynamic, as in, as long as the flow of export of commodities continues, then you guys will be a wealthy economy. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, so, so, so I think there, 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 you, it's important to draw that separation. Now, what could change, you know, the fortunes of uh, Australia is your main exporter or purchaser is China. So economic bifurcation, much as the one we've seen with Russia, where you can no longer sell your product to China, is probably your biggest risk. And somewhere, and, and so as part of that risk is where do we sit on the point at which China goes to war? And you can't do that anymore. Then you end up with a huge collapse. And then the issue is, can you resell your resources to the Western world along long trade routes, which might be interdicted? That's the whole issue of separation here, because you're not going to see your, you know, you're going to raise rates, but you're in effect, your economy will grow because you're selling commodities at a higher price. So you're hedged in a strange way. You do have a different dynamic and therefore you're more likely to move further up the curve before you see change. Um, mm. And I agree with that, whereas Britain's already seen the change because the burden of inflation is just killing people. Mm. So I think those are your variables that let you move further up the curve before you see change and why I, I could see why you think you might even get to the peak under that basis as long as you can maintain your exports to the western world but i think you've painted a picture there that's really interesting that we should look into because you're painting a picture of what the the situation of what might occur to australia when we get to that point in time because one of your books is called red lightning and it is, it's such a great title. It's one of those titles that just make you want to pick up the book and read it because it's about how China wins the, the world, World War III in 2025. Is that the subtitle or is it how the West lost World War III in well, 2025? Sometimes you win, a, you win a war, as you know, you yeah. win a war, let's be honest. Yeah. And it's basically how China wins World War III. Yeah. And, um, Which, I mean, what a brilliant book to have to write with your background and your knowledge. I mean, I can imagine that there was a bit of, OK, I can I can actually visualize how this is going to happen because that's your shtick. Right. I mean, you really the patterns, your patterns that you have created, that you have tested. And now the predictions that you made and the forecasts that you are making are falling in line with those patterns. And they're allowing you, you know, not from, on the one hand, giving you a bit of joy because you're thinking, oh, this is great, you know. But then on the other hand, there's this, you know, hang on a second. Oh, no, what are we really going into? And this is something that that's actually where I want to focus for a moment is you. I watched an interview with you where you made this comment that you wrote breaking the code. Of history. history when you had your twins and that you were sat there thinking to yourself your whole perception obviously must have changed as it does when people have children and you thought to yourself well hang on a second what world, what world have I brought them into and where are we heading because we're heading towards this point and nobody wants to envisage that it's going to be a war and I've written about it we've got to be careful of world war and people have written to me and so we've got to be careful but it's a bit like the pandemic no one wants to think oh we there's a world war around the corner and then somebody with your background that's got all of these models already kind of pinned in that you can actually visualize what's going to happen I guess that's the, the conversation that we need to have because that this is the one where we're going to have to think to ourselves individually what do we do I mean, where where is Russia? Where is sorry, Russia? Where is Australia placed when we? What what is the scenario that you've got in that book? So so you you're absolutely right, and it's nice that you remember what motivated me to write Breaking the Code. When you said that, I I actually felt you need a you need a voice, and your voice needs to be heard quite widely. That, and that. it's even more so because I'm a dyslexic. So the idea of writing a book was a human challenge beyond anything. I think before that day in um, Los Angeles when I was feeding Horatio and Madeline with milk, um, I always had a challenge reading what I wrote the previous day. Uh, my spell checker gave up on me and, you know, I avoided <laughs> anything that required like that. In fact, all my spell checkers have been corrupted by my spelling, but they some of them endure. 
And, and, and then the next day I found myself able to write something that I could read the following day, which was a breakthrough. So for me, Breaking the Code this was a journey of actually writing, uh, articulating, um, and something which has grown ever since to my surprise. I was terrified, to be honest, because the sense of certainty that came with the understanding of the Kondratiev cycle. By then I'd proven my empire cycles really worked and things were happening around me that were ticking boxes along that route. And I remember thinking, what, what, what do we wish for our, par our children as parents? We wish longevity, happiness, and the continuation of our knowledge and our genes. And I had come across knowledge which suggested they might not make it. Mm -hmm. And I felt so burdened as a parent, somehow that had found this knowledge that I need to share it. I mean, as a hedge fund manager, we're very secretive as a group. So the idea to start talking about those ideas is actually not what you normally do. And I started to break the mold, do things differently, and hence breaking the code of history. Um, as that pattern carried on, I knew why we were printing money in 2012, and I didn't want to fight it because I figured it could be, you know, gone forever. I didn't want to be a, a like long of something I didn't believe in. I didn't want to fight it. I did promise I would come back in 2000, uh, whenever, and at the peak, I would take the opposite position. And in the middle of 2019, I'd already written Lions Led by Lions. Mm. And Lions Led by Lions came about in this fascinating way. Again, one of my children was involved, Horatio, because I gave him a present of two tanks to make and for Christmas. And he said, Dad, Dad, could you help me? And in my, if I get any spare time, when it's dark in the winter, I, I've always built models. <laughs> yeah. So I looked at him and I said, uh, I said, all right, well, let me just find a battle we can do. And we'll build a diorama. So I started for the first time really looking at the First World War. And of course, you go to Ypres and you go to the Somme and you go to Verdun and you just think, what a waste of life. And you know, why and how? And suddenly I found this battle called the Battle of Amiens. The Battle of Amiens, 9th of August, 1918, where you had the Australia Corps led by Monash, brilliantly led by Monash, yeah. was the definitive point mm. where basically the BEF, went on the offensive and rolled back Germany in 100 days. Britain beat Germany. Yes, France was to the south, but it was the whole evolution of tanks, combined artillery in the British army that basically broke the German army. Mm. And I was amazed at that. So I broke, broke lines there by lines, talks all about this process of lateralization in conflict, and also talks about the parallels of World War I and the failure of Britain to deter conflict by Germany through its weakness and socialism, led by Lloyd George and the parallels with the Western world. So there was a story even in that book about history should be rewritten and reseen, but the lesson was how Britain failed to deter Germany. And it talked about China in the opening stages and the parallels. That was in 14. So then in 15, I devote, wrote a defense review saying Britain needs to be heads up, not decreasing our defenses, but increasing because we would go to war somewhere in 22 onwards with Russia and China. Mm -hmm. uh, that was seven years beforehand. And then in 2020, before the next review, I was so fed up with what we had done. I wrote Now or Never, which was my view of the threats we face versus the defense review we should have. Yeah. And I got it into Boris's office. I got it into the Treasury. I got it into, you How know, all the environment. How did you uh, get through the people that follow Through the people that follow me hmm. and their connections, they become increasingly influential. Um, and he stood up and said, you know, a week afterwards, use words in it and said, defense is important and then betrayed that whole construct soon afterwards. And I remember looking at our defense review thinking, there we go again, failing to recognize China as a threat because there were commercial interests at the highest level of government and all the dynamics that go with it. And I thought, how can I explain to people how dire this situation is? So I thought, I'm gonna write a book. It's like a book that emotionally addresses the issue of where we're going. And I needed to do it in 50 pages so you could read it in an hour and go, shit, like, please, <laughs> Please defend us, Mr. Government. Mm. And the basis of it is all systems, as I mentioned, have hegemonic weapons of challenge, a new system they think they can use to overcome the power base of an old system and a, a decaying hegemon. And China and Russia have spent huge amounts of money on hypersonic weapons. And I've been warning since 1718 that those weapons were designed to kill carrier groups. And at the moment, our technology couldn't stop incoming weapons that would saturate the target. And in effect, that space of hegemonic challenge was opening out in front of our eyes. Mm -hmm. And I've been quite amazed at how sluggish America has been to this threat, because it is the threat that destroys their carriers. And in um, uh, Red Lightning, essentially, it explains a world 
of weakness. Uh, it does, and I did it on purpose. I didn't think it was going to happen, but I did it. I explained how we brought China, Russia on side at the last minute and orientated to the West, but in the commodity down cycle when it was weak, because I wanted to highlight at that stage, there was a chance for strategic rapprochement when Putin was super weak economically, bringing him back on the side of the West surrounding China. And so they're, they're, they're on our side in the story. That was intentional. It was a political message that we could still do it. I think we still could have done. I think mm -hmm. we made a fundamental mistake, you know, in 1920 and that whole period. And as soon as commodities were going higher, we were into overtime trouble. We didn't recognize that. Anyway, it then talks about this attack, where the Chinese attack, the American fleets, they attack. They have missiles which go and destroy ships in Portsmouth 10,000 miles away, and how literally everything that's conventional, every warship that sits, fits the bill today, is destroyed in 20 minutes. And then the next part of the chapter is essentially about um, one of our carriers and a, a battle group that's been modified with all the new weapon systems we could build which would change that paradigm. And it was meant to give, this is what happens if we don't, and but we can if we do this. And it's a very Tom Clancy piece, it's a lot of technology, but explains what we could be doing to actually counter this if we mobilized ourselves. And in the end, it talks about the fact that we lose control of the seas. And finally, the Chinese steam out and they literally, as Britain did, surround each country one by one and starve it into submission as we did Germany in 1918 and how democracy dies. And when it comes to the moment of, shall we use our nuclear weapons, the weakness of our leaders is such that we would prefer to live under whatever terms the Chinese offer us than we would actually fight and maintain our freedom. And so we don't even use them. And it's basically the death of democracy as a result. Mm. And so the global domination of China using the same social constructs of control they've applied to the Ouija's in Hong Kong and their own population applied to the whole rest of the world which is exactly where, what I've created. Where does Australia, because I, I know that you've said that you think Australia has been ahead of the curve in terms of its recognition of China as a potential threat and defending ourselves. I can tell you that's probably not what the concept is on the ground here from Australians. I don't know that they would look and think that we've handled defence um, that well and that there's a big US influence as well well in it and I think that there would be a concept in in people's minds that we're probably bending too much to the US than we are that we should that we should be more um making alliances with China rather than you know sort of bending to to what's happening you know with the US defense and siding with them um, if that makes sense. I mean, that, that, that these are the things that are kind of discussed here because we're so dependent on China economically. Well, um, and we poke the bear a little bit with, um, you know, what happened in the pandemic because, uh, you know, we were the ones who said that there needs to be an inquiry as to what's gone on in China and where the pandemic came from. Um, and that wasn't, uh, well, we, we suffered repercussions from that. Well, I think... Uh, I, I mean, you've always been a feisty nation, you know, you're a nation that was founded on convicts and they were obviously pretty feisty together in the first place. And I love that. Seriously, when you guys stood up and said, ask questions, it to me, it epitomized the very best of Australia. Like, mm. you know, screw you. We're not going to do what the rest of you do. It's bloody obvious we, we, we've been, you know, victimized and we want to know an answer. And I think when I think of Australia, I think of that feisty, screw you kind of the response. And thank God for it, you know, some 24, 25 million people prepared to stand up collectively and say, hang on a second. Now, you've got the same problem that Russia has with its dependency on Russian energy as you have with your exports. But the thing that's really important that we in the West need to understand that the CCP is not and does not want to live with democracy. Because whilst there is a spark of freedom, it views it as a virus that could literally destabilize its world. And especially with Xi, its vision is global domination and the eradication of democracy everywhere. Mm. This is not something that essentially, you know, we, 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 I'm creating because I want to mobilize people. It's a reality of their behavior. And I give a whole speech on the history of China based on the cycle of empires. And it's incredibly similar to actually the Japanese expansion. Very similar, you know, a civil war in, you know, sort of 1868 for the Japanese emoji restoration, end of the civil war in 49 for, you know, the communists winning over the nationalists. And then exactly the same period between 
um, Japan turning on its mentors of Britain and America in Pearl Harbor to 2022. And so we're into that same period of expansion where the system turns around and has a go at the people that have provided the technology to found the system that they built. China is not, and China is at a critical moment where it's, you know, into its last year, its four year period, where it's gonna go bankrupt or expand. It's basically got a hegemonic window of operation. It's got Biden as the weakest leader on the other side, although there are some question marks around whether he now leads and whether people like Lloyd Austin have a bigger voice than Biden in terms of responses to Russia. But nonetheless, it's very clear that the West will get more belligerent and more defensive as time goes on following what's happened in Russia. So the window is going to close on China and it either makes its move or it never makes its move because its demographics are now negative. Its productivity is sliding. So it either moves now or it never moves. And she... I think innately believes that power equals survivability, power for himself, power for his nation. So mm. I, I think it's not a question of do we have any options? We have no options, as we found with Russia. The only option you have is you fight for your survival. And the earlier you declare your boundaries and your red lines, maybe you have a chance of deterring conflict. And I think, you know, if you look at the Type 26 frigate program and, you know, you look at the, how you are, you plan to arm those frigates, they're far more heavily armed, as the Canadians have done, than we've armed our own frigates. They're, they're formidable ships. Arcus is about getting nuclear submarines, which is your best form of defense at the choke points. Because if you look at the Pacific conflict and the Battle of the Coral Sea, I suspect you're going to face something very similar, where they, at some stage, they try to come for, it, for Australia, and you know, rejecting them, ejecting them on that same line of defense is going to be absolutely critical. Because wars have this habit of repeating themselves because they have the same topographical limitation, limitations to the same sides through time. Mm. So I think the wake up call your Navy needs to be bigger has been around for some time. So you do have bodies of your government which have strategic understanding and you have mobilized much earlier than Britain has towards that threat. Mm. How would you um, comment on the idea that the US is not interested in fighting direct wars um, but rather fights proxy wars, like in, in the Ukraine, well, Russia. Look, and... look, look all, all empires are smart, because if you can fight a proxy war that disables your enemy, as did Afghanistan, you know, it, coming off the peak of 75, Afghanistan was a humiliation for the Russian forces. And also their economy was at the backside of a commodity down cycle. That's a strategically smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. And um, at the moment, even if we wanted to fight, in Ukraine with NATO soldiers, we would be thrown directly into a conflict with another nuclear power, which is not a thing that really anyone wants to do because its risks are enormous. Mm -hmm. The truth is NATO is already at war with Russia. Mm -hmm. It's just in everything but the words or the actions. And mm -hmm. so essentially they're right to follow this strategy, but with China, there will be no proxy war and China will, and there's evidence that companies are secretly supporting Russia. That's gonna come out more and more because China can't afford to see Russia lose or Putin deposed because it needs Russia's ICBM shield, which is their long range nuclear missiles mm -hmm. in, in, you know, in the upper court of war, which is strategic nuclear warfare. And the reason is they've spent all their time building medium range missiles to destroy warships in the Asian basin with hypersonic warheads. Mm -hmm. And they just don't have the capacity to do both at the same time. They need resources to come over land because if they go to war with the West, they can't protect their sea lanes initially against submarines. And so for those reasons, she's not going to see Putin go down. And mm -hmm. I think we will see success with the next offensive from the Ukrainians with the weapons we're sending them. But then there'll be another cause and effect, which is at what stage do the Chinese step up to support the Russians? Mm -hmm. And we are at this domino process where once the genie of war comes out, and we are talking about, you know, the third, the third sort of installment of autocracy versus democracy in its clearest form, you can't stop it. And this on beat, ongoing heartbeat of the C wave of the K wave cycle, which has got a long way to go, is going to keep lighting a fire under everyone, especially and, the aggressive. And of course, you've um, you forecast of China moving into Taiwan, which could happen very quickly. I mean, the, the, that that's already been acknowledged. And you know, talking about resources, I mean, um, well, Taiwan is twenty percent of global yeah. semiconductors. Exactly, but uh, we need to I mean, phones, TVs, washing machines, cars, computers. I everything. mean, that, that would be a big. I mean, Australia would have to would well. I mean, that would step in at that point. 
You know, I mean, these well, are the threats that we face globally. See, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think that China has the option of just invading Taiwan. And the reason is, is it's very clear with the weapon systems which you've seen in Ukraine, that a contested invasion is not going to happen quickly. And hence you saw them trial a blockade system, because I think if you're a Chinese planner, you know, the moment you try and do a contested landing, you lose. So the next thing you do is you seek a blockade. Blockades take time and you expect the Japanese, even if the Americans don't, to say, I'm going to come and support you, which drags the Americans in, which means that by setting the blockade up, you are now fighting Japan and America, mm. de facto. Mm. So that leads you to the process of the only way through that is a preemptive strike on everything in the Asian basin within range of my DF-26s, which is, you know, all the way out to Guam and you destroy the carriers and the ships of Japan and America in the region, then you install a blockade, then you have an anti-submarine campaign. And this is really important, is without destroying submarine supremacy, you can't get across the strait. That could take 60 to 100 days. So this war isn't going to be the click of a fingers. It can't just happen suddenly. The sudden comes with a preemptive strike, I think, in the model that I'm working with. And the fact that the Chinese are sort of moving away from wolf warrior diplomacy and trying to be more appealing and, and moderate scares the crap out of me because I, my hypothesis, they're going to do it when we least expect it. So you mm. don't do it when you're making lots of noise. You do it when everyone's quietly having Christmas dinner. So mm. I think we have to be very mindful of that. And the U.S. Navy you is. It, you absolutely. had it time for 2022, though, didn't you? For Weren't you calling that to happen? So, in so, 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 yeah. I th so, uh, what's interesting is that um, the fact that we got through it, and the Chi and the Chinese didn't join in with the Russians, meant that the Americans did something to deter them, mm. without doubt. Because the evidence somewhere along the line is that she and Putin knew exactly the date of what was going on, and it was delayed past the Olympics. So, the fact that she didn't join in means that something happened which we don't and we won't be privy to with the Americans threatening and and you've got to understand she's in a bit of a difficult position because his whole advance requires a new weapon system to work and he's got to and if it doesn't work they're screwed because American carriers will turn up on their coastline and pummel them to death mm -hmm. so it's a really sort of a big roll of the dice and you know if you go back to Hitler Hitler rolled the dice and his generals didn't think it would work and so it's going to take a lot of courage and he's going to be stuck in a corner where there are no other options. And I think the, another, the no other options come with the collapse of Putin's Russia or economic implosion in China. And at that stage, he just does it anyway. But somewhere between the two, when he when he had choices, I think that there is quite a lot of hesitancy, which I would be, too, if I was him. Mm. The, I, I know that everyone who is who is watching this, anybody that subscribes to me who's watching this is like screaming, well, you know, this isn't a painting a real glowy picture of what's gonna, what's going to happen. Um, if we get to the peak of this cycle, everything collapses, equities collapse, real estate collapses. Where are the safe havens? What are you saying to, to people that turn to you? I mean, where do people put their money? What do okay. they do? Where do they go? OK, so, so let's go back a little bit. You won't believe this, but I am an optimist by nature. Right? And, and, and the reason why I'm sharing these views is not because I'm here to say we're screwed and you like give up. I'm here to paint the terrain that we are sitting on so that we have options to actually overcome the challenges ahead, whether it's by mobilization and deterrence or whether it's by belated responses that get us through the initial engagements like the Ukrainians did when they were invaded to recover, to, to, to struggle to do what our ancestors did, which is to push back autocracy and hopefully, you know, win whatever conflict happens and to endure and harden us to something that is difficult ahead rather than hope for the best and be shocked. So I do believe in deterrence first. I've been screaming deterrence for two decades. It hasn't really been heard. So the next step is effective defense and survivability. And I think we're into those realms because we just haven't reacted fast enough at the moment. So what do individuals do? Well, first is start screaming at politicians that they're being negligent, that actually there is a threat and that threat de demands to be represented and start looking for the types of leaders in your society that are lateral and adaptive and can lead in times of high entropy and not to just accept this drivel and this, this, this stream of linear incompetence, which just fails to see the tidal wave coming towards us. So every one of us has an obligation in democracy to be a part of that demand to mm. our leadership. And, and to do that, we talk to our friends, we share our concerns, 
it does not uh, beholden us to basically suppress them because all we're doing is just perpetrating the outcome. And I mentioned earlier, you you did about women. And one of the things that really frustrates me is put on a war film at a party, all the guys will sit there with their beer and watch it and the girls go somewhere else, right? That sounds so archetypal, but it's true. Talk about warfare to the majority of women, they're not interested, not their domain, and yet they will have to send their children to fight those wars. So surely, shouldn't mothers be much more engaged as to how wars start, why they start, how to deter them, how to stop them, what to do? Because otherwise their children are sent off to war with the consequences of previous generations. So I think true equality and the balance and change in society will start when women take those interests can match, you know, and, and bring with them a different concept, which is men too tend to be more aggressive and expansive. And you're more likely to see a male energy, I think, initiate an autocratic conflict than you are a female energy. So there's balance to be had from female energy being brought into that concept, that demand in our Western societies. And sadly, it, it just doesn't happen, but it needs to happen. And for those that want, believe in equality, and I do, equality comes with standing up for understanding a fundamental human process which is how we go to war and how we don't go to war mm. and having a vote an informed vote mm. so I, I really urge every every female listener to to think about that mm. and and the rest and the rest of it is really about becoming more aware and and we can't just put a head under a pillow and say not on my watch because mm. it is on our watch mm. we're in it if yeah we can get I through this there'll be uh, last thing if we can get through this i think it represents a watershed of change for humanity which is yeah. why I dubbed this decade catastrophe or consciousness, or consciousness or catastrophe. So mm -hmm. I think there's some silver lining through this if we navigate through it. We um, are, but, yeah, I mean, I know that I made that comment to you about women because I heard you say that you wanted them to read the defence papers that, you've, that you'd written, the information that you'd written on defence. And um, I know that Fred Harrison, when I've spoken to him, and he said that he kind of feels that he wants women to take a bigger role in pushing for economic change, which is how he sees the solution to where we're heading, is that um, it's the fight for the world's resources, it's the charge for man's thirst for economic rent, for these unearned, unearned windfall gains that can be achieved from monopolizing Earth's resources that kind of drives human nature. And his idea is that, that women can have a part in that as well. But what, what people are gonna wanna know is what do they do? People, People are frightened. I mean, people, the subscribers that write to me are frightened because they say, okay, we're approaching the peak. Where do we put our money? And I mean, I, I've heard you talk, you know, about precious metals and gold. What, what's your opinion? If everything's going to collapse at that point, and we're also looking at commodity collapse at that point. Okay, what, what, so, 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 so. Uh, you're, you, I must admit, you're very well informed. You've listened to an awful lot of what I say, which is <laughs> lovely. But also, uh, um, but I, I think right now, um, the traditional elements of how people have made money for the past two decades through the world of money printing, we're in a new domain. And that new domain, as you just said, if there's one thing I believe you can do that makes, you know, will get you through this, and I try and think about, I do change my views. So people hear me say, buy precious metals. And then I'll say, actually, I've changed. I, this is a top and I'll sell it here and buy the bottom. And, say, well, and I say, well, you know, if you really want to follow my work, pay for it, follow it. Don't just listen to me once for a freebie and hold me to it. But generically, I think we are in a surge of precious metals, which is, you know, to do with dollar weakness and to do with a commodity surge. So, yeah, if we weren't as meet for three years, I would say that's the space you want to be in. You do need to speak to you about when to get out because I can see government intervention taking it from you and all sorts of dynamics. It's yes. not straightforward, yes. but it certainly yes. will get you through and preserve capital. And, and resources like energy, I think, are about to surge too. So that's another space. And basic resources and metals like copper, that's another space, and food. And I would confine my interest to those domains you know, if you want to hold something that goes up and, you know, there's nothing like something that goes up because it exponentially can really go up and some of the shares therein. But, you know, again, this is a general look in that direction. If you want to find out what to do precisely, then you need to sign up and then yeah. you'll get real time updates to go with that. Yeah. Rather than, and my work is much more about corporations and individuals, mm -hmm. marinations are for individuals. 
it's basically geopolitically you know what to do where to do it but also i do sprinkle like you know you should be in precious metals because it's your year and the place to be i can mm. i can do that um so i think those are your safe spaces holding on to things that have made you money so far comes with a risk that the mm. domain's changed and there's a huge give back mm. so and you are in australia a commodity economy so you will benefit from this as long as your one buyer keeps operating. But believe me, if your one buyer pulls out, just mm. imagine if your buyer was Russia and yeah. the world prevented you from letting your resources go to Russia. Imagine what a basket case Australia would be in. So mm. that's the one scenario you've got to watch mm. is how does the world bifurcate? If it bifurcates suddenly and you wake up and you find that the Asian basin is alive with sinking American and Japanese ships, then you need to bail because you're going to take a long time to recover and redistribute the same amount of resources to the West. Mm. So yeah. that's yeah. that's your that's your <clears throat> caveat, approach, I think. Yeah, the the other the other two things very quickly that I was going to mention was I also um it, it's this concept that if we have war, and particularly if it involves nuclear war or some kind of nuclear fallout and i know that there's a whole range of different nuclear weapons we're not necessarily looking at the destruction of everything there's much more nuances in how they can be used now but um it, i think that there's also this concept of where do we go where do we physically go like where on the globe is physically oh, well, okay there? So let, and, let's and just you talk about that. something actually this was in, from an interview which i thought was really really interesting where you talked about is it in finland where they've um, built these underground bunkers where um people can go yeah the whole of the whole of the whole of the finnish population can amazing. live underground amazing and they, yeah. what's interesting about the Finns is they never stopped investing in their civil defense program <clears throat> and yes their population is you know relatively small but still we're talking about considerable underground facilities and they turn public pools into pools that then became you know, it could be fallout shelters blast shelters and actually shame on the western world for not continuing that process because it's a long-term investment in the civil protection of your society and its resilience but of course with western liberalism we just disregarded all of that but your question about nuclear war is one that does need to be framed and I think if you go back to the Cold War, you know, the perception was the Soviets would invade conventionally into Europe with a huge tank army up until the revolutions in the revolutions of 84, 85 with Abrahams and Bradleys and much more modern war fighting technology. That invasion would have quickly resulted in gains. And if NATO hadn't have held them back within 12 days, the assumption was they went nuclear. The first stages they would have gone is tactical nuclear weapons against, you know, con concentrated armor formations, probably in Western soil, which motivated West Germany to have a very big army, funnily enough, knowing that if the army couldn't hold them back, then the next step would be they're blowing up their own territory. Mm. And the argument then goes that essentially the Russians retaliate with the tactical weapons. Somewhere there's a big standoff toe to toe of who's got the intention to do the next stage and who hasn't. And then finally you get to the stage where it goes horribly wrong and full on nuclear exchange and we all go poof in thousands of nuclear weapons. That's how the mutually sure destructive ladder works. Mm -hmm. Now, what we saw with Putin was he created a strategy called escalate to deescalate, which became official policy in 2019. It was such a warning bell to the world that he planned like some adventurous activity and wanted to keep it. And his story sort of went along the ways of surprise capture of territory which became russian and then essentially use of a single nuclear weapon which said bugger off it's mine otherwise you'll all die mm -hmm. and the perception the west was so weak that actually they'd accept the capture of that territory and assimilation of it and go back to their homes and hope it didn't happen again now not a bad assumption really when you look at the weakness of western leadership and that's exactly what he did at the onset of ukraine he threatened the west with a nuclear exchange if we got involved. And I'm afraid to say it's just like a bully in a playground. He is a bully. And I advocated at the time we should have gone toe to toe and someone should have rung him up and said, Mr. Putin, the weapon, after you drop the weapon on Ukraine, the next weapon will be landing on your head. And we know where you are every single moment of the day. Trust me, you won't survive that. That's what we're going to do. And that would have been a real thing to him, would have been a real like, OK, now I don't survive, not going to do it. And also it would have shown the intention. And the problem is that Putin is, through his judo, he's used to being 
hand in hand with another human being and fighting that human being and feeling the energy of that fight. And he has a nature of a bully, which comes about with his background. None of our politicians have any physical understanding of physical fights, yes. which are about how bullies interact and change and, and operate. And we never, ever did that. And if we had, honestly, I think we could have stopped Ukrainians tracks. But we didn't. And we had Biden running around like a headless chicken. Can't start World War Three. Can't do this. Can't do that. Everyone else crapping the bed. And essentially Putin laughing his head off because his theory was right. He was given the space. And if he had, had an effective land force, he would own Ukraine right now. And we would be sitting there thinking, now what? Now, about six, 12 weeks ago, when you know, those two offensives in the north and south of Ukraine had really humiliated Putin, I think he became very close to executing that plan. And finally, the US got with the program and Jake Sullivan threatened this massive conventional strike on the whole of Russian assets, mm -hmm. which would have had effectively the same effect as a nuclear strike, would have forced the Russians to retaliate with nuclear weapons and link the single use of a nuclear weapon in Ukraine with that ladder of mutually assured destruction that took place in the Cold War. And hence, we got through it. Mm -hmm. The nuclear ceiling is now higher. And I think the confidence of Western leaders is such that they are now giving armored equipment for an offensive action, feeling that ceiling has now been established higher, facilitating the retaking of ground. And I think they're probably right about that. Mm -hmm. So the thing that is really important is we don't fight wars to die. We fight wars to dominate. And we don't seek to dominate if death is certain and failure is certain. So every single agency, whether it's the Chinese or the Russians, seek to fight underneath the nuclear umbrella. Now, you look at me and say, is that possible? Yes, it took place in Korea. America was humiliated in Korea despite being a nuclear power, yeah. right? Vietnam, America was humiliated in Vietnam despite being a nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Russia was humiliated in Afghanistan despite being a nuclear power. Yes. So we have been fighting under nuclear ceilings for quite a while now. Mm -hmm. So don't think this is any different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. I know we're out of time, but I just have one, one final kind of thing <laughs> one teeny little question <laughs> <laughs> well it's just because I, <laughs> <laughs> I know that um, a lot of people will be saying that you know we've been in world war three for a period of time now again it's another concern that people have in regard to cbdc central bank digital currency and how that is going to control humans um, basically track, track, tracking you from, you know, birth to grave in terms of your spending power, but also in terms of the social systems that they can build around it, as we've seen in China. Do you have like an opinion of that? Because obviously, you know, there is this concept that the, the banks are controlling, the bankers are f fund wars, they control what goes on. Okay, okay so, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be so first of all, yes, we are, I think, in World War III. It started with the invasion of Ukraine. Actually, it probably started with the pandemic, if we're mm. really, if you know, I suspect, as a hostile act, and history will record it differently. Just as World War II started with the invasion of Manchuria by the Japanese. Mm. And, you know, if you want to be European, it was really Czechoslovakia and, and paying off Hitler by giving it to him. He used force to achieve that. So, yes, I think we're already in it and we need to work doubly hard to stop it from spreading. Mm -hmm. And that little clip about the doomsday clock being seven seconds away is right, in my opinion. We are on a precipice that's pretty scary. Mm -hmm. Considering 12 weeks ago, we were at the same point as the Cuban Missile Crisis and most yep. people are not even aware of it. It's we, 60, we're living years, 60 years from it, which is a big exactly, one cycle. I analyse, exactly yeah. Right. Um, and for those that follow cycles, most fascinating timing. Um, so going back to digital currencies, look, the march of big data and our imprints and footprints cannot be stopped. Yes. And so it's a question of what we do with that, whether it's how you buy in your supermarket, where you got your petrol from. The truth is that by the time you put an AI program on all the data sources, you can be tracked from birth to death in what you did, what you, your changes, everything. It, so it's going to be about the legislation that protects the individual from the misuse of that that. that. And that process is going to keep going. Yeah. And digital currencies, you know, I don't think blockchain is going to last very long. We're on the edge of a quantum computer revolution, which just breaks everything apart. It's like such a change, most people don't understand it. But I do think cryptocurrencies are maybe the alternative in a, a period of loss of dollar hegemony. And so I do think that there's a, a massive surge in cryptos to come, whether you see one more low, final low, and then a surge, or you go straight to the surge. 
they are actually another safe haven dynamic. But no one asked me those questions because they've lost interest down here. I yeah. think I, I was selling Bitcoin at 66 and covered them at 18, and, and now we're coming along with it. And yeah. you know, but I think it's that's a restart. So I, I and I don't think okay. So banks may fund defense companies, but I don't see them as the all-purpose Davos manipulating group behind this. This is once you understand these collective systems. They're just parts of a system and they're playing a wheel in a cog of something that's much bigger. Mm -hmm. and, and that bigger process is our unconscious collective patterns from empire cycles to the imposition of Kondratiev cycles, which are really entropy cycles. They're all part of this great human endeavor to evolve. What we're going to evolve to, or are we going to continue beyond this point is in our hands, mm -hmm. but it's part of that unconscious evolutionary process that we so desperately have to become more aware of if we're going to transcend it and be a sentient race. Mm. The the crypto thing is is very interesting because even if we have an economic collapse, you know, what we which was what we forecast and we're saying that that's going to happen, Bitcoin's not going to disappear. It's still going to be there. So, I mean, how it actually evolves and, and um, you know, sort of continues going forward is going to be very interesting to witness. I certainly don't think it's the end of the story just based on what's happened over the last year. Yeah, I think we've got one massive surge to new highs. Mm. Oh, interesting. There'll be a lot of people that'd be really happy to say that. <laughs> yeah, we've given them lots of clues as to how to survive now. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's it. Go to Finland, move to Finland, you'll be fine. Buy and, and, and to, you know, to that end, there's an awful lot of information. You've unearthed it yes, on my I site. Have in the public domain. And one of the things I've really tried to do is not just say, this is going to happen. I'm trying to explain what drives it so that people can be empowered with a much more realistic understanding of humanity, its history, its evolutions, and what they imply to the choices ahead of us. Yeah. And you know, hopefully people will take up that opportunity. And if you need you know, asset management advice, and you know that comes at the higher the levels, but for institutions, it's a game changer. So. It's all there if people want to engage with it. And governments um, come to me and all sorts of things with you know policies, issues. It can apply to every sphere of the human endeavor, which is why it's so fascinating. There is a wealth of information on your website. And I'm so glad there is because, yeah, I mean, I, I knew that there was, I, just the extent of your knowledge is mind blowing, to be honest. I don't think anyone else has kind of looked at it in the depth and detail and from the angles that you have. Um, so that's one reason why I know a little bit is because coming on to do an interview with you, I have to admit, I was thinking, oh, I just don't know how I'm going to handle this because, yeah, I mean, it's a very, there's, there's, I mean, even now we could go on for hours. There's so much more that the uh, knowledge and information that we could talk about. So I do advise anybody to go to your website. You can, you can get a free excerpt from Break, Breaking the Code of History, which you've got there from Cycles Magazine, because it was published there. So if you sign up, you can get that download. So you can get an idea, a really good idea of the type of work that you do. And, and then of course, you know, there's the subscriber basis, which aren't, overly expensive either i mean they're, they're they're very reasonable really for the information that you're going to get from che those. cheaper than a newspaper and it'll give you more idea of what's going to happen next than any any group of newspapers yeah, or, or any economist any mainstream economist it's going to give a better idea of what where things are going so um yeah thank you so much david i'm so appreciative that that you've come on and, and had a chat with me i really appreciate well, i just it. hope it wasn't as bad as your worst nightmares thought it, it was <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it was certainly wasn't it was very enjoyable and yeah like I mean I could I could talk to you for hours there's so much more to discuss so um yeah maybe we can do another chat like and see definitely. how things progress over the next definitely. few months and then jump on and have another discussion be very but, very happy to do that yeah. be a great privilege okay thanks so much David I really appreciate it and Pleasure, uh, Catherine. talk soon